So today we're going to talk about covering Congress. First of all, how many people in this group cover Congress on a regular basis as part of your job? So we, we have a lot of experts in this room already, which is great. Um, I've invited a couple of reporters for this session and the next one who are very experienced at covering Congress, uh, different, um, different pieces of Congress and for different audiences. And so they're going to talk a little bit about their experience, they're going to have some tips, and it will of course be open for questions and discussion. So thank you very much. Nils Lesniewski uh, from Roll Call is here. and. Karen, is it, how do you pronounce your last name? Demergent. 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 It's like emergency, but you drop the Y and add a D. Okay, Demergent uh, is here. She's with the Las Vegas Sun, both uh, award-winning reporters, and um, thank you very much. So you guys can take it away. So. So. Anyway, so you, well, you guys know a lot about this already, which means that you can jump in with any sort of additions and corrections and whatever you totally disagree with that, that we say. Um, but just to start out, I mean, it kind of is, it's good that you're doing this so early in the year this time around. It was the last time I did this session, it was like, uh, midway through. And it's kind of good to start off with congressional reporting because it's the best way to figure out all of DC. As dysfunctional and as non-functional and non productive as Congress is, and everybody in the country knows it right now, um, it's actually the most fertile ground from which to find out what's happening in every corner of the administration that you could think of, um, in the harder to source places like the Pentagon, especially when you're responsible for covering multiple different parts of DC and can't split yourself up into 12 parts to cover all the beats that you might have colleagues to do in a larger paper. Um, because usually if something's going to happen, and it's actually at the point at which it's going to happen or it's being discussed as a serious option. It's going through some channel, some person, some committee, some person around um, Capitol Hill. Um, and the trick is to figure out physically and not physically where, basically, <laughs> depending on what, um, what sorts of areas you focus on. And I'm sorry. I'm soft spoken. soft in the back. My fault. I'd love to put the fan back on, but oh, I'm sorry. Not yeah, that's why. Right. Right. Basically, I was just saying that um, it's it's the, the trick of figuring out Washington is is if you can source Capitol Hill well, you can pretty much figure out the rest of D.C. from that, and and have much more um, direct access to information than you probably would trying to go through any piece of any of the agencies, unless you happen to like you know have gone to college with someone who happens to run whatever program you want to do. I mean, it, in in the basic reporting scheme. Congress is the best way to go about that. Right, and so one of the so the first thing uh, that we wanted to do for those of you who are not uh, on the Hill all the time, uh, particularly, is just to go through the basic sort of logistics uh, of the way things work over there. Uh, and really, there's a couple of different pieces to that. There's both the the physical layout, which uh, I'll get we'll get to in just a minute. Uh, but the first thing that I wanted I wanted to just note for those of you who are uh, operating up there or who will be in the near future um, it's been and maybe this is a good way of explaining how the place works the way it's been working in the last week with in the midst of a government shutdown uh, has been an interesting thing uh, and sometimes a frustrating thing uh, just as a a practical matter uh, because we're seeing things uh, like there are you need to know which door all of a sudden it's become very important to know which doors you can and cannot go into because some of them that normally would be open are now closed um, there's there's limited support personnel uh, on scene all of the all of the various press gallery staff has been declared to be essential uh, which which is a good thing for us, um, but a lot of the other uh, support offices are gone uh, for the moment, uh, shuttered. Um, there are situations where there are communications people and people who I work with regularly, who I'm finding out have been furloughed themselves. And so there are there are cases where you have to where I'm in a situation I haven't had I haven't had a situation where I've needed to do it yet, 
Um, and we'll get to the sort of previewing the second half of this presentation. I was reading a story in a Kentucky paper yesterday um, where it literally noted that Rand Paul's communications director had been furloughed. She is? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm um, Rand Paul's communications director is a presence on Capitol Hill, yes. so I should have noticed that. Yes. <laughs> um, and, but so some of that, that, so that sort of thing is happening a uh, two, so in the, the, the immediate term, I just wanted to get that, that some of what you're seeing right now is not normal. If you go up there in the week, next week or two while this is still going on, you're going to see things that, <coughs> does this always work this way? The answer is no. True, but it, I mean, that's one, uh, th that's an example of how, um, and a testament to how Capitol Hill may be the one place where like shoe leather reporting still really exists in DC. Like you have to actually be able to work calls, work different people, chase people down, know where you're going to cut people off and and not work through the various echelons of communications, staffer, whatever that is basically I mean if you were if you report <coughs> out of the White House, you are in a little metal box, which is what you see on TV, which is a hell of a lot smaller when you're actually in the room if you haven't been there yet, or in the basement below it, which is where the desks are. And if Jay Carney decides that it is your turn to be able to be, you know, knighted for the day. You get to come back into the area where they have the different offices, but that's basically it. You don't get to go to the West Wing. You don't get to go to the East Wing. You don't get to see anything that's like really happening um, because you're blocked off. And it's a similar deal in many of the agencies, although it's not that way in the Pentagon because you can roam the halls and talk to whoever you want, but again, everything's behind like secure mm -hmm. doors. When you have a badge to get you to the Capitol, you can basically go absolutely anywhere except for like the House floor and the Senate floor. And during the shooting last week, several of my friends actually got to go onto the house floor right. because they got shoved in. So the point is that like it, it, the access is there if you work it, um, and maybe we should get into how to work it. Yeah, let, let's. So first, a breakdown. Maybe, of, like, the okay. So, as you probably know, uh, the Capitol is that big thing with the dome on it that you know breaks down to the house on one side, the Senate on the other side, and my geographic directional signals right now may be very off, but um, House is to the south, Senate's to the north. Um, this is an inside view of the second floor, which is the floor that where all the action really happens, where you've got the Senate chamber, the House chamber, that's the rotund in the middle that has a really pretty dome, and all the statues and picturesque stuff. Um, but that, before we get to the physical stuff of this, this is not actually, this is one where area where it can be important to report. But um, the rest of, uh, you know, the, the breakdown of Capitol Hill is that um, the big, w when bills are final and when they're going through their like final debate stage, basically, they end up in these areas right here. But before that, there's the committee level stuff that happens, the <coughs> subcommittee le level stuff that happens, the individual office stuff that happens. And all of that happens just, you know, a block off of what you're seeing yeah. here. Um, but depending on what you cover, you're going to end up looking at anywhere from one to how many committees are there in Capitol Hill? Like I mean, there's... 25, 30? Yeah. Yeah. And Everything from, like, agriculture to education and labor to natural resources to energy to banking to finance, which is somehow separate from banking, to which I did study economics in college, so that was news to me when I got here. But um, And everything replicates itself almost exactly on either side of the hill. So you've got mirror image stuff happening on um, either side of the hill in, in that you have this breakdown of every issue. Um, and I mean, this may be going back to like real 101 sort of stuff that you know ever since you're three years old, but like, you know, the bill, uh, the, the traditional pathway for any piece of legislation is to Someone has an idea, they start writing it probably with the help of a legislative council that's affiliated, you know, or, or whatever committee staff that they have. It goes through a whole bunch of hearings where you can um, be one of like, the, basically no reporters show up at most of the hearings unless they're exclusively working for a place like CQ and covering the hell out of agriculture, or like really, really, really focused just on that immigration subcommittee, which may be one of the few subcommittees right now where people do pay attention. But like, it's a great sort of way of figuring out what's happening, what might be percolating before anybody else. Because a lot of this stuff does actually happen at the subcommittee level in total public view but people are just aren't paying attention because there's so much other stuff happening. And at least when I was my first job here, like that was some of the best ways because you get to, people get to know you by sight, you get to know them, they start to tell you about what they're working on that hasn't even necessarily come to the point of a published hearing, and all of a sudden you know about stuff bef way before it gets to this level, which is the level it gets to be you know, on cable television. 
and it's a way to be able to break stories on your beat, on things that are relevant to your beat. Um, and knowing how, being at the start of the food chain basically is the best way to get that going. And that, and that works uh, regardless of whether you're working for uh, something like 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 CQ or roll call or your wire service or whatever it may be, or if you're working for a local paper, uh, and I'll use I'll use the the one of our, our lovely we're gonna use we're gonna use all the we're gonna use all the Vegas examples and all the Nevada examples you probably this morning. Them so much. I love them so <laughs> much. Um, but you know there are hearings at that there were a few, couple of years ago now. You know, they started holding when back when Barney Frank was still uh, the chairman of the Financial Services Committee in the House. They started holding hearings on um, on online poker, and they would hold these hearings on online poker, and you'd have these people from trade publications that were in the in the gambling business that would show up, and you would have every local reporter imaginable from either Las Vegas or if you had Atlantic City or if you had tribal casinos. Uh, anyone who was worried about the possibility that if there was a uh, a big entrance of, of online gambling into the marketplace it could cause layoffs at their local employers basically. Um, and so there are there are issues that are it, not only do the big issues like immigration sort of start in an ether where people may not be paying attention. There are other issues that, quite frankly, the reason why there's so few reporters there is because there are very few markets that are interested in whatever the issue may be. Uh, but if it's the Natural Resources Committee and they're designate, trying to designate a national monument that happens to be in your state, well, then maybe you should be the only person there because no one else is really going to care, but your readers very well may. This is a, a list of all the, the top line committees that exist on Capitol Hill. And basically, I mean, they, they don't always have the same names, but each item that gets considered <coughs> in the Senate committee also has a counterpart committee in the House that considers that issue. And you kind of have to pick and choose based on what your beat is slash if you cover a delegation, who you cover and what your state issues are slash what committees people happen to sit on. And each one of these headings has like about four or five subheadings in it that also matter. Um, and that's a, they don't list subcommittees. And you wouldn't want to because it would take too much space and time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, up. yeah, and and the other the other thing on this, which I'll I'll just I'll just say briefly, the other thing mm -hmm. that I would. Uh, note is this g good point about how when you have a del when you have a, a delegation matter, uh, or you have a if you have a powerful member on some committee, mm -hmm. you may end up covering an issue that you that really doesn't even particularly affect your constituents all that much. Right. There's a two sided thing of that, which is that you have to when you're covering your delegation. You can't just source out of your delegation because the issues that affect your state are going to be probably decided at a higher pay grade than they are, um, unless I mean, unless it's Harry Reid. But even with Harry Reid, you can't just source. I mean, you have to basically get it from everybody who hates them as well because their your own delegation is usually a lot more tight-fisted with their information. But um, then. Uh, so, so like Niels was saying, if you have members that sit on certain committees and they happen to be the chairman of a subcommittee, they're going to consider things that have absolutely nothing to do with your constituency but may have a whole heck of a lot to do with how you cover that individual member because maybe they're doing something really revolutionary or maybe they're doing something really shady to get something done or maybe they're selling out their constituents financially to do a favor for somebody else because they happen to be sitting at the top of a committee. So you kind of have to know the whole web around anybody you cover and the committee structure is the perfect way to do it because this is what lobbyists look at. They look at, okay, well we want to get our, I'm going to use another Vegas example, right? Like we want to get um, do, 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 nuclear energy industry, right? Which wants to get Yucca Mountain up and running so that there's a dump site so we can start to build more power plants, right? Is going to go after any of the committees that have anything to do with energy, is going to go after any of the committees that have anything to do with, you know, public lands issues and natural, re that natural resources, anything environmental. And there's just going to be a lot of, you know, 
interesting fundraisers on the side or interesting conversations that happen. There'll be political donations that are made. And usually those things, unless you're talking about someone who's a leader of Congress, like a Reid or a McConnell or a Boehner, the money tracks through this structure. So knowing <coughs> where they exist and where they're, and any member is going to be on anywhere from two to five committees, right? But knowing kind of like where their finger is on the pulse of influence can help you report out every kind of story from policy to, you know, the dirtiest kind of politics, um, which is always the juiciest stuff that your editors will love. Yes. So. We go to the map. Let's go to the map. Let's go to the map. Uh, and I'm going to start the map with an, an I'm going to start the map with an anecdote, which I hadn't planned on until after until <coughs> late Saturday afternoon when this when this uh, anecdote happened. <laughs> I was, uh, I was, I, I spent a, a lovely, you know, 85, 90 degree uh, sunny day Saturday in the Capitol all day. The House was voting in the morning. The Senate was in session in the afternoon. <coughs> Lots of speeches in the Senate. Not a whole lot of anything actually happened, but nonetheless, I was wandering around. And at one point, as I was wandering around the second floor of the Capitol, uh, one of the things that I was doing on... Um, on uh, Saturday was I kept walking I don't normally walk like wander and spend a lot of time wandering in the rotunda <coughs> that's not because it's where tourists go except for not right now because there's no Capitol Hill tourists but it's smell I mean Sorry. <laughs> it is crowded, crowded mm -hmm. with tourists. Harry Reid got in trouble once for saying it smelled like tourists. It does. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's where people just stand there in groups with their little listening devices and taking like weird <coughs> iPad videos of everything they see that they're never going to watch. But so, so this weekend, <laughs> I'll stand up too. So this weekend, um, what happened was I kept walking in there every every couple of hours to see. Who exactly was there? Uh, if you know, if it was if it was completely empty, uh, and a couple of times I ran into members giving tours, um, because members were members are allowed to give tours during the government shutdown, but nobody else is. Well, you can too if you have an yes. ID. Anyone who has a permanent ID can do that. So. Yes, but the the normal tour guide. The tour guides were furloughed, so members are giving tours themselves. I ran into a couple giving tours on uh, Saturday afternoon, but one, one, at one point, as I'm walking from my side, I get a fork to point at <laughs> things, as I'm walking from over here uh, towards the rotunda on one of my passes through at like 3.30 in the afternoon, I'm walking this way, and out of corridor this corridor this corridor right here pops Harry Reid and his Nevada press person with, along with the security detail and the two of them pop out of this hallway here and start and slowly as Reid is one to walk these days back <laughs> towards his office which is back this way um, here's a perfect example of, okay, there's a couple of choices. What's he doing there? What's he doing there? Uh, that particular corridor he came out of has a couple of different things, and this is where we start talking about geography and why, ge why learning the lay of the land is important. The particular hallway that he came out of leads the back way into Mitch McConnell's office. And this is important just because he said he wasn't negotiating and talking to the Republicans, which, what's he doing there, using his bathroom? Probably not. <laughs> or you can go around this way, down this hallway in the back, and this leads you into John Boehner's office. Again, Again. you're not supposed to be talking, it's the public line. But so was, was Senator Reid, so that prompted me to then have to ask, where were you? It turned out he was going to pick something up at the office of the attending physician. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but, this is, the, the reason why this story is useful is because I do this all the time. Sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong, 
You run into people in certain places, you have to ask the question, what the heck are you doing there? Because... And then you get mocked being like, why do I always let you ask questions? <laughs> yeah, he doesn't like you. He loves you. But. Can I just interject how important it is that you called and or tracked him down to ask the question? Because I can see someone inexperienced and overly excited just tweeting it out. You know, just, just saying. Just came out of the quarter that leads to blah, blah. Yeah. Wonder what that's about or Which, something. Yeah. Which and that would have been embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, I, I know I said earlier that you can go anywhere with that badge. It's not totally true. The reason that Niels couldn't know exactly where he was coming out of is that Niels can't actually go around back out to all of these different rooms back here because you will get pushed out in a way. So you probably, I don't know if you realize that the attending physician's office was back there. I wouldn't have known that. I, I knew it was down the stair. It was, it's, it's below there. So, so I knew it was there. in that vicinity, but not exactly where it is. But you might find out that there's something that you didn't actually know about that's down some corridor where you know what two of the doors go. You know, that you know what's behind door number one and door number two, but you weren't quite aware that there was a door number three. And you, this is only, you figure this out by the more time you spend there. And it actually helps to spend a lot of in-person time, even though explaining this to editors who are, in my case, 2,500 miles away is sometimes very difficult because you're like, why aren't you constantly, you know, just like blogging, blogging, blogging. It's like, because there's a value to spending, taking 15-minute breaks and working the halls and just trying to figure out, um, or, or longer, doing stakeout. Um, should we talk about stakeout areas? Yes. Okay. So the place and time in which you'll probably see the most reporters gathered at any point um, in the Capitol um, is around vote time. So they call votes in the Senate and the House. Buzzers go off in all of the office buildings. The members usually have 15 minutes to get to the floor and cast a vote, though usually there's some flex time in that. It depends on what it is, how badly you know the leaders want to box out the minority party and everything else like that. So, um, But there is um, an area uh, around each chamber where reporters can gather, and it's the greatest choke point because they only have a few options of how to exit. You know they're going either here or here. And they are sort of sitting ducks. Not perfect sitting ducks because they have a few choices of where to go, but if you need somebody to say something for a story or you're trying to chase down a lead or whatever it is, and, and you just don't want to go through the press secretaries who are probably gonna try to spin you off the scent or whatever, the best way to do it is just go straight up to a member who's not expecting you to ask the question, catch them off guard, they all, like to talk and be paid attention to because that's why they got into except this for David in the first Bitter. Place. Except for David Bitter, who will never talk to you, but you can always get a no comment from him or call my office if that's what you need. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like catching members off guard is sometimes the absolute best way to get an honest answer. It's usually the best way to get an honest, the best chance you're going to have at getting an honest <laughs> answer, I should say. And so there's choke points around the Senate and the House. Should you do House yeah. versus Senate? House, we can do House, house first. is more straightforward. So, first thing is when we talk about uh, stakeout, there's there's both the way you find any member you may want, and as well as there are points where they set up for the TV cameras. Uh, in the house side, generally, you'll see a microphone stand set up next to the statue of Will Rogers, which is why it's called the Will Rogers Stakeout Position, which is approximately yeah. here. Um, and then, and so that's where if, if you're looking for the news of day, sort of what is the, the thing that everyone's talking about and you need the, <coughs> the comment from uh, Eric Cantor or from Nancy Pelosi or whoever it may be, whatever their sort of stock uh, Whatever they're doing the for the cameras, for, C for CNN and Fox, they'll go out to the cameras there because they want to be in front of the cameras. But then you're getting what they want to say. When you want to catch somebody who doesn't necessarily want to be in front of a camera or maybe wants to tell you something but only on background, you got to go elsewhere. Um, and so you can kind of see on the floor plan, you might point out the, the cloakrooms and stuff like that. Yeah. So I can't so even tell which side is which from the well, okay, so this is So this is the, the exit that goes across the house. Yep. Not that many members come out of here. Um, and the deal is in the House chamber is that all of these sort of like anteroom areas are cloakrooms. So when they leave the chamber, they have this weird sort of like circulating membrane of tunnels yes. that they can go into and hang out and use their computers and talk on the phone and 
try to evade you. Like many times you will have someone look like they're going out this way, but then they'll sneak into a cloakroom and then they'll end up coming out this way so they can evade you. But there are basically like the, the options of exits are here, 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 the two sides which go straight to the elevators, and then here. And this is the best spot usually to catch people because this is the speaker's lobby. You cannot wear flip flops, and guys don't even try to get in without a jacket. They will yeah, it doesn't grab work. you by the scruff of your neck and throw you out. And I was thrown out my first week on the on the job, and it was kind of embarrassing. But so as long as you dress nice enough, this is an area in which members, when they have a series of votes, and in the house they never usually take just one vote. It's usually three or four. So they're like hanging out for an hour. They get bored. Some of them like want to smoke and go out to the balcony. They want to use the bathroom. To get to any of those in-between things, you have to go in and out of this way. So it's like you will always see reporters just flood. And when the government shutdown thing was happening, it's the busiest I've ever seen it. Like it's basically wall-to-wall -wall reporters. So and members are trying to like duck from the crowd. But it's the best way to actually be able to um, catch people. Yeah. And then you can... And if you're looking for someone in particular, and you can't seem to find them of their own fruition, of your own fruition, and it, they, um, you then are, you have another option, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. It's kind of a crapshoot, frankly. Uh, is there's a little desk in the middle of the speaker's lobby uh, where reporters can put, in, can put their names on these little index card kind of things and their names and their publications to request that a member come out to talk to you. A specific member. A specific member. So you are doing a story on, oh, I don't know, let's say, let's say you're doing some kind, of, some kind of healthcare story, and for whatever reason, you really need someone from the... Uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, which has a lot of the healthcare jurisdiction in the house, you may, but you don't, and you don't necessarily need someone. Sometimes this is the best. This works best in this situation. You don't really necessarily need a specific person, but you need a Republican on the Energy and Commerce Committee who might know something about this health topic. So you have like eight choices. Well, you sometimes you, you put in cards, hoping that someone will actually respond to you. If you're looking for a specific person, like if you really need uh, a specific congressman from a specific place, uh, your odds are a little not, great. not so good. Not great. just try to stop them. That's always the best way. Um, Niels is bringing up a good point, which is just the know your members that you have to track game. I mean, it's not a game. It's like a necessity. You need to... You cover a certain area of issues, you need to know the names of the people who think about those issues. And then you need to get this on your phone for the first bit of it. I think I did this the last time. There is an app if you have a smartphone, because you can get a paper book of this too, but just when you're learning. It's the Congress in Your Pocket app, and it gives you the faces and the um, points of origin of every one of the members of Congress. The senators are pretty easy to learn. I know, it, you know learning 100 faces sounds very daunting, but it actually happens pretty quickly because they have a lot more individual face time. House members are like, they're, they're just so many. They're just really hard to keep track of. And so many of them are slightly balding, slightly round-faced men of a certain age, you know, that wear <laughs> similar suits and are of a similar girth. It's really, really difficult to tell them apart sometimes. So if you keep this sort of thing on your phone, you can just kind of be like, ah. And also befriend the staffers in the galleries and in the speaker's lobby because they are really nice people. And the cops, too. I mean, like, they are really nice people and they know these guys because they have to, like, you're dipping in for maybe an hour a day to do these sorts of stakeouts things. They're there all the time. They are stuck in these positions. Sometimes they rotate. But, like, not only do they probably know who to point you out in people's faces, but they can tell you about, they, they get sometimes a heads up about what the schedule is going to be, too. So yeah. like, it's a great way to just, you know, one, have fun people to talk to that are not completely politically obsessed and also just, you know, source. Sorry, what's the name of that app? Is it? I Governors? think it's called Congress in Your Pocket. It's showing up yeah. as Congress on my phone. Oh, it is Congress? Um, or is it Congress? It looks like I see Governors in Your Pocket there's or Illinois pocket, in Your Pocket. There's also a Pocket Congress. They might be I, that. I pulled it from the Apple Store, yeah. Congress in Your Pocket. Yeah. 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 ye
I just, I mean, I actually had to pay 10 bucks for this, and I'm not trying to stump for these guys, but I found it. You either can pay 10 bucks for the paper book. It's governor's, okay. Oh, weird. Really? That's not the one. Do they not have it anymore? Yeah, they don't have it anymore, because the governor's in Illinois. Okay, forget I said it. There is a con congressional pocket. You can get, there's a publication that's like a little wire-bound book. It's a Facebook, basically, of everybody. You can get it at the beginning of every Congress, or, I mean, the one that's out now is good for the 113th. If there's special elections, obviously, they don't update it, but it gives you, basically, you know, a way <laughs> to try and look through. And you, you, it, it doesn't work so well if you see somebody walking through and you're like, who is that person? Because looking through faces, it's not organized by faces, but if you're like, I need to find Congressman X from X committee, and I just cannot for the life of me remember what he looks like. You flip to the picture, you look at the the, the page, you look at the picture, you think, all right, add 10 years to that picture. What does he probably look like when I see him walking past me? And then that's, it, it helps. I've, I've relied on it many times. So, um, but there's Senate. an opportunity here for somebody who's, you know, got some skills to develop the facial recognition app. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, if Facebook yeah. could do it, why shouldn't it? Here's who it is. Um, so, and then on the Senate side, yes, it's actually easier on the Senate side, to be perfectly honest. There's um, four exits. Um, this is the Senate cloakrooms in the back, but there's no way for them to leave without coming out one way or the other. Um, this exit goes straight to Harry Reid's office, and usually it'll be just Democratic leaders that use this way out because, you know. Um, Mitch McConnell will always leave this way and go back to his office, but everybody else will either Comment. And he won't say anything. He just, never. Just, 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 just. <laughs> um, the this hallway is where they do the camera stakeouts in the Senate. It's called the Ohio Clock Corridor. There's the Ohio Clock is right there. It was actually made in Pennsylvania. I have never understood exactly why, but Niels might know because he just knows everything. Right. Um, and then there are the this is the elevators. And this is the place where usually they come up and down. There's subways that go underneath in the basement, on both sides of the Capitol, actually. But they'll come out of there. You can grab them coming off the elevators. They'll either go straight into the chamber or dip into this sort of side room. And sometimes they have meetings in here off the floor. You can catch them right there. But it's basically like this is the spot to be if you want to catch a senator. And they pretty much, it's a bottleneck, uh, much more so than the House. So, um, and and the other thing is is that uh, not on this map, but just mentioned, um, as those of you who are on the hill know, you, uh, at any hour of the day or night, particularly if there's a vote looming, uh, you will often find me loitering by the trains in the basement. Because he likes trains. I like the trains. I, I am not. I'm not Joe Biden, but I do like the trains. Um, the uh, way that the basement uh, setup, and the reason why the basement setup works better in the Senate than in the House, a lot of people you'll meet. Pe you'll go to. You go to find senators at the Senate subway. You don't really go and try and do that in the House. This is not helpful. But it sort of is actually. Let's. Like yeah, there's there it is. Or right there. Right, but see, they, it's, it, you you hardly ever see anyone waiting, looking for someone in the house because there are multiple uh, access points to get back to the office buildings. There's a tunnel, which is pictured down on the bottom, right? There's oh yeah. The tunnel, and the um, the subway, but there is, as you can see, there's only one way out. Unless you walk, unless you walk outside, which when the weather is nice, some senators uh, will do. Uh, there's only one way to get out from the Capitol to the Senate office buildings without going outside. So it creates a it creates a major a choke point too, uh, particularly after the lunches. Uh, Senate has every caucus lunches every, every Tuesday. Tuesday afternoon. So today, while you're here, no, not today, tomorrow. Tomorrow, it's Monday. Yeah. I can't remember sorry. what day of the week I it is every either. Every day this week, do not take away a day. <laughs> I'm sorry. Tuesday. On um, the the and, the and the lunches run from 12:30 to they they take off from 12:30 to 2:15. In reality, the lunch usually ends around 1:45. Uh, 
Um, and what they're doing in there is they're discussing, like, it's Democrats meet with Democrats, Republicans meet with Republicans, and they're discussing strategy. So usually, like, it's the, afterwards is the perfect moment to catch them and be like, how are you going to screw this up now? <laughs> um, and, um, and both uh, party leaders, as we were saying, both party leaders then hold a, a news conference by that clock. Um, uh, McConnell it. never veers from his talking points. Reed is prone to making what would be, in the view of a communications professional, a mistake. Uh, just, just two different, two, in, two similar but completely different people. And 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 McConnell getting McConnell off message is something that it's hard. is really hard. Uh, um, we've spent a whole bunch of long time talking yeah. about how to grab senators. I feel like we should just put in a shout out to staffers as well. Yes. Because this is actually probably going to be the hardest part of the gig. I mean, we've talked about talking to communications directors. That's straightforward. Talking to senators, it really is just gymnastics. Um, but sourcing in the non-press side of uh, any, any office or any committee staff is possibly... Um, is what separates you from doing, you know, news of the yeah, day. Yeah, it's what you're in the back, just like raise your Sorry, hand. Sorry, it's what's that? Mind her to speak up. It's what will probably separate from you from doing news of the day slash things that you happen to pick up to and from doing, you know, real sort of cutting edge is a really terrible term, but you know, stuff that's basically going to be agenda setting and is going to actually change the way that people. Um, talk about policy or approach policy is going to be the stuff that is probably why most of us keep in your house in the first place <laughs> to do stuff that isn't just, you know, parroting that um, is big. I mean, you can sometimes do that off the senators too, but when you're working through the press staffs, it's often difficult to be the driver of where your scoops come from because many of them on the Hill are, I mean, you're part of the game. Like, this is a big political game and Sometimes that feels great, and sometimes it feels awful. But you're a piece mm. of the game, and they are going to try to use you to further their objectives. And sometimes that will mean if you work for a big enough publication or a strategically important enough publication, you're going to get the leak. It is very, very orchestrated. And then you're going to get the story, but it's the story that they wanted. Um, and it's kind of funny the way certain people approach it because some news organizations are like, oh, you know, we got this great scoop. And it's like, no, you didn't, right? And sometimes it's a legitimate scoop. And you can, once you've been around the hill enough, you can usually tell which is which. But that's the way, um, it's, it's, it's that sort of nebulous, sometimes it's you, but oftentimes it's really not when you're working through the press offices. Yep. When you develop relationships with the policy staffers who are not supposed to be talking to you and will probably never talk to you on the record but they will give you background information that will basically be the way that you piece together what's actually going on or what is going to be the pitfall in what people are trying to do um, right. by talking to enough of those people on both sides. And, and, and I, would, I would just say as an addendum to that, uh, I personally have had this happen, um, not in the immediate recent history, but I have had this happen where I will have had a legitimate scoop, largely by talking to someone who was either, either was not a press person or was not, or maybe was a press person but was not the press person associated with the office that the story was about. Right. It was someone who was telling me something they'd picked up about some other senator um, who was not their boss. Because remember, these people on Capitol Hill, they hang out together, they live together, they drink together. There's a Capitol Hill culture that makes them know each other's business. And so one, <laughs> so <laughs> more, yeah. You know. They do. It's really insulated. Right? So more than, more than once, um, I have had the situation, and it comes up every once in a while, where you have a, 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 a some sort of a scoop, and you go to confirm it through the normal channels, and you get stonewalled, and in the intervening time that it was stonewalled, it appears in another paper, another publication, phrased in a way that is far more favorable to whomever it was that you were going after than had you written the story. Yep. Um, so this is, and that is one of these things that it's impossible to tell people, but I'll say it anyway. 
You can't get discouraged by that because that actually means you were doing your job. If they, if they didn't, if they didn't trust you to write the story, that's because there's something they're trying to cover up. Good reporter. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely happens. Yeah. And it's because you're part of the system um, by being here, even if you are and. We hope we all are the reporters of the highest integrity and non swingable ness. It doesn't matter. You're still writing for something that's public. And the truth is that they have very few legitimate ways to actually speak directly to anyone, to their voters. They can do press conferences ad infinitum. And with the prevalence of cable television, they can actually reach a pretty wide berth that way. But, you know, when those get old and stale and repetitive and their poll numbers start to, you know, flag because everyone's getting so bored of it, then another way to do that is through you. And there's, I mean, they don't spend very much time at home, even when they sit, take weeks off. Like, they just don't see that many people. So you're, um, you know, the box. And, and, and because Capitol Hill has become so, so polarized, like, there's so much <coughs> political everything is fraught with political sensibilities of, oh crap, how is this going to affect my chances or my party's chances or whatever I'm planning for the next election cycle. So like there is nothing that these guys do that they actually can consider casually anymore. And it, it, it used to be even, I mean, I've only been on the Hill for like three years, but like even three years ago, well not really, I was on, when I was on the Hill for like a year, five years ago, it was not like this. I mean, there were things that were big political issues. I was around the last time they did immigration reform. That was ugly, 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 ugly. But it wasn't like every single thing was, holy crap, how is this going to play into my poll numbers? How is this going to affect my next election chances? How is it going to affect, like, you know, who in my party can run? Like, you actually had, on other things, a little bit of, you know, breathing room. And I don't think that there's anything anymore. Except no. for when you're like, let's keep the troops funded through the shutdown. Okay, no one's going to be an idiot and vote no for that sort of thing. <laughs> or same deal with the furloughed workers, yeah. I guess now. But I mean, yeah, except for when it's so obvious that you'd have to be a true idiot to make a political situation, everything is an issue. Yeah, like raising the federal debt limit. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, no more. That is, <laughs> it's the word debt. The word debt is very... Right. And... and very, and and I th I think the only other thing um, that that goes <coughs> into that is knowing that you have a particular that there are times within this sort of particularly polarized ecosystem that you know that you have uh, more so with some than others, but sometimes you have a function in that ecosystem, and sometimes that actually can work to your advantage. Yes. Um, my own case, um, I myself have a rather peculiar expertise, which is the, like, wonky rules and processes, and uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty good uh, with the sausage making. Can I throw something in? Yes. Really, the best way that you can get to know Capitol Hill is to become friends with Niels, because he does know, he actually knows more than anybody else, and if, he's, if, you, if you're nice to him, sometimes he will save your ass at 2.30 in the morning, or you have to catch him on Gmail, and be like, I don't understand this, and he'll set you straight. The point is, Niels is the like, best resource in the best gallery. Okay, continue. They, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, no, but they, but so, but so since my, my, my sort of place in this ecosystem is I am the rules guy that means I get people who fly people on the hill off the hill professors in st. Louis I have all sorts of random people who will feed me um, things that you know it's like they're that's that's an issue. This happened uh, just a this happened a few weeks ago <coughs> when this ethics can um, I don't know how many of you have heard this story, but um, someone believed to either be associated with Barbara Boxer and or Harry Reid drafted this this thing against David that was basically against David Vitter that said Vitter had tried. This is, this, this is actually a very important thing, which you've probably heard of at this point, the shutdown debate. Vitter had been the guy to sponsor the thing that said, look, we want to end the 
the equivalent of the employer contribution federal subsidies that the members of Congress get before they go onto the exchanges and purchase their health care. The Vitter Amendment is what it's come to be known as. It's a huge bargaining chip right now that when Eric Cantor says the Republican position is no special treatment for members of Congress, no special any, that's what he's talking about. So that's where this started. Reid didn't like it, and, and Reed? No, the Democrats don't like yeah. it in general. And so someone f decided it would be the bright idea to float a counter to the Vitter Amendment that would say you also can't get any health uh, employer contributions for your health care if you have, oh, I don't know, solicited prostitutes. <laughs> if you don't remember back in 2007, David Vitter was the one member of Congress implicated in the D.C. Madam scandal, and it was, that's why he doesn't talk to reporters anymore. He's terrified that someone is going to ask him a question about that still, and so he's just like... <laughs> <laughs> so, so there were, in that, you know, in that situation, I, you know, I got, like, emails out of the blue from like any like all sorts of cottage industry ethics experts as well as you know actual copies of letters started turning up in my email that were that were being exchanged back and forth from people I don't I still don't know who some of these people are I mean I know who they are but I've still never met them or never talked to them so Sometimes when you have a particular s place in the universe, you'll, you'll start to see things that will be passed to you because, oh, you're a good person to give this to, even if you don't have a relationship with whomever it is that's on the other end of it. And that just goes to say also that, like, no matter what capacity you're in, you're reporting in, if you're reporting on the Hill, it has become pretty much the most consistently large story in the country. So if you're doing decent reporting and you're keeping some sort of a public profile and curating some sort of a reportorial persona, whether it's in your hometown or on Twitter or whatever it is, you know, and, and being relevant to some, to in some capacity outside your own little bubble, people are gonna pay attention to what you do because, I mean, everybody, this keeps happening, like, the whole, you know, dysfunction of Washington Congress thing, I mean, like, Syria comes and goes, you know, what else is coming on, like, the most recent thing I can think of. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm struggling to Egypt think of Egypt revolution comes and goes, yes. and America gets bored of it. Syria comes and goes, and America gets bored with it. I mean, I'm not saying that Congress is the most important thing happening on the planet. In, fight, in fact, I'd probably fight people who suggested that it was, yes. but I don't think it is. But for whatever reason, for an American audience, it's what sells over and over and over and over again. And Congress keeps selling the American public crisis after crisis after crisis. So if you do this and you do it at you know a level that is respectable and for in a capacity that matters outside of your own little fiefdom, mm -hmm. yeah, people are going to find you because you get no. Yeah, and and that's true both of um, you know certainly Twitter. Uh, you know you you start w my in my case whenever there's Whenever the Senate looks like it's on the verge of collapse, I get a spike in Twitter followers. Yeah. That's my sort of existence. And that's when I do, and that's when I end up doing TV and doing all these sort of ancillary things, is because, is, and, and that causes a whole different set of an audience. And even some people who you deal with regularly suddenly know your name. And you get weird weirdos sending you strange marriage proposals too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what are we forgetting? I think we're taking questions is okay. what we're doing because I'm starting to see hands <laughs> pop up. Hi, yes. I'm Natalie. Hi Natalie. Um, so my question is, I guess it's kind of broad, but um, I thought it was really interesting when you were talking about in that particular area how you know you got kicked out because of flip flops and oh. um, so can you think of anything else on your first days when you were in the Capitol reporting? Um, stuff that, that you wish you knew and that it, you can't like, read in a book or maybe <coughs> someone who's giving you the big picture might overlook something like that. Yeah, um, well, I, other than the flip-flop episode, which was terrible because Betsy Rothstein was in the gallery at that point. This is when she was, because uh, she's now uh, fishbowl, but back then she was hurt on the hill. 
And I remember that she tried to be like, she's like, I'm going to write about this. Do you want to comment? I was like, absolutely not. I don't want to comment. She's like, well, it's going to be in the story. And I could see her trying to see my name on my ID badge. And I was like, no, my name is impossible to spell. And I'm going to just hold it away. You don't know who I am. Um, <laughs> I think that the thing that I, that I remember being an issue for a few months is that when I started on Capitol Hill, I still had like senator shock and house mm -hmm. member shock because like I was, what, 25 when I first started. And like I had seen these people on television and that's the only experience I'd really had drilling. I mean, I, I dealt with important people before, but the only experience I've ever, I'd ever had dealing with a member of Congress was when, you know, they'd like throw parades in my hometown for a member of Congress. And so I got nervous about asking questions where other people could hear. Like I would feel like the other reporters were going to judge me if I asked something too parochial or think my question was phrased stupidly or I'd stutter through it or like, it, and, and it took me a few months to get over that. So I would say that the one thing that I would encourage any new reporter to do is just speak up because you, after you do it like three or four times, you realize that these guys are just people, sometimes they're just tools, like, I mean, it's, it depends on, no, but I was just saying, like, I mean, they're just doing their thing, which is sometimes something to be impressed by, and sometimes something to really not be very impressed by at all, and you just kind of get to realize that, you know, you're, you eventually start to feel a bit like, I mean, you're not exactly a peer, because you're not representing 600,000 people or whatever, but, like, you're dealing with them on the level, because that is what you do, that is your job, and the fear of that is something that it takes a little while to get over, but, you should force yourself to do it because it gets so much easier with you. Um, I might ask for, I, I'll, I'm going to respond to that by first asking for maybe a show of hands on something before I know how far <coughs> I want to go down this road. Um, how many of you have either a photo or video component of your own job? Is that, that's increasingly becoming something that has to, is happening. Okay. It didn't happen when I started. This wasn't really this whole digital journalist thing had not really caught on yet. But the one thing, other than the speakers' lobby rules that are really, really, really important, are the gallery policies regarding where you can use a camera, where you can use a video camera, which doorway you can't shoot at. Um, and so if you're going to be using any sort of multimedia technology at all, you need to familiarize yourself with all the specifics of how th of the rules about video of that are set by the radio TV gallery and the photo gallery. Yeah. And, that, and they're very nice. They will explain it to you. And they've even got a little handbook that will tell you what it is. But and as long, the rule usually is that as long as you obey the rules of the other gallery, even, you get credentialed to one of four galleries. Um, and this is just, I mean, it, it's an antiquated view of journalism, to, to be perfectly honest. Daily press, which means that you're publishing at least five days a week. Um, periodical press, which means that you're publishing once a week or something. Even though a publication like Politico is in periodical press, so like, whatever. Um, radio, TV, um, and photo. And, I mean, and, and it, there, it's, it's a, I think there's been talks in the past about trying to blend some of them, but it's a bit of a fiefdom issue and no one wants to lose their power. The point is, if you're credentialed to daily press, which is probably what most of you are, um, you can, in almost every situation, carry a camera around the Capitol and you can do whatever you want to do with your daily press badge so long as you obey the rules that the photographers are compelled to obey. There are some major events. And this is weird. One year for the State of the Union, I was allowed to bring in a camera. And then the next year, I wasn't. And there, there's like a constant negotiation that goes on. And you just kind of have to kind of like watch and figure out what's happening. If somebody yells at you, you'd be like, sorry, I didn't get it. OK, put it away. Not a big deal. Um, mostly people will be pretty nice about explaining things, except for when it is like massively huge, giant security type of events, like when the president comes down to the hill and everyone is going crazy. Um, but other than that, yeah. Also, you want to just be judicious about when you do it because um, oftentimes you can, people will say, you know, will want information to be, your editor will be like, oh, shoot me some video of somebody saying something. I mean, 
keep in mind that like video from Capitol Hill, it's going to look boring. You know, it just does. It's, it's a guy or a girl in a suit <laughs> standing in front of a marble column or maybe a nice rug that's kind of worn in a certain area. And like, and that's it. There's not very much visual color. And it makes people clam up. I have even noticed that sometimes when I'm holding just a voice recorder to make sure I get the quote right, that makes people clam up. And I'll put that away for certain people because I know they're going to talk to me differently if I've just got my hands on my hips and jotting a few notes down and I'll get much better information. So if you do all, do wear several hats, like you just have to kind of figure out the t personalities you're dealing with and when it makes sense just be like, you know what, I'm just going to let that camera hang on my arm and not, not stick it in their face because it's going to, it affects the information you get. And sometimes the visual information is worth something and I would say more often than not, it's not worth as much as you think it is on, on Capitol Hill. It, it's worth a lot if you go to back to your district, if you go and do shoot a video package about an issue, issue that they were talking about on Capitol Hill. But most of the time when people are talking in public about things, there are ways to get the C-SPAN footage. If yeah. you really didn't happen to be catching it right then, if you need someone making a speech, it's there. And if you're the person who's trying to balance and ask a hard-hitting question, I mean, people don't answer risky questions on tape. They just don't. Questions? <laughs> um, just a question about, about rules. Um, you had mentioned um, that sort of your niche area, and I will admit that that's the one committee I really don't want know much about. Um, can you just explain, I guess, what's the advantage of knowing the rules committee and how this fits into story ideas and, and scoops? And okay. Like um, th we're talking about the House, because the, yeah. the rules committee in the Senate has no actual function, really. Um, the, the Rules Committee in the House, uh, for those of you who have never been there, uh, third floor of the Capitol, little tiny room, not nearly enough room for anybody to be in ever. Um, the, the most interesting, I'll, I'll do the sort of short version of this because I have a sense more of this will come up later uh, at some other presentation you guys may have. Um, there, but what I'll say, What's important there is that, A, they're setting the ground rules for debate on the House floor. Um, and so if you're going to be following a bill that's coming up on the House floor, it's important to know the, the rules that are set out by the Rules Committee for which members can offer amendments, <coughs> uh, how long the debate's going to go on for, and just sort of the basic logistics of it. You know, what if you have, if you have a, a, a structured rule in the House and it's got a list of amendments in it, there's not going to be any surprises, frankly. The House does not operate on surprise. Surprise in the House means the place is falling apart, which is... It's happened. Which happens, but that's, happens. that's... They happened when they rejected TARP five years ago yeah. now. Sometimes on big, big things, it, it, when, when the leadership has been doing whip count and they think they have it, they tell the press they have it, then, ha-ha, you did you yeah. lost your tea party guys or something. Then that's, yeah. yeah. But the other thing about the Rules Committee, which can be, um, it, it's an interesting, ex you can get interesting material from it. Now they're all webcast, so, um, and, and C-SPAN's been increasingly bringing cameras in uh, as well. Um, the most interesting quote that I ever have gotten um, in my yeah on my time on Capitol Hill, um, uh, which I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have it right in front of me, but it's pretty <coughs> darn close to what it was. Um, this was an emergency rules meeting that was probably held at like eleven o'clock. Started at like eleven o'clock at night. It was when the Democrats were in the majority in the House. And the, 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 the person, the guy who was chairing the Appropriations Committee at the time was this guy from Wisconsin named Dave Obey, who was quite a character in his own right. Um, and he showed up needing, needing what they call a closed rule. He needed them to stop. They were having an amendment process on the House floor. Things were running, were going to run off the rails 
So he had to come in. He had to go back to the rules committee in the middle of the night and say, "No more amendments. No one. I need you to tell. I need you to set a rule so that no one can offer any more amendments on the floor before this goes crazy." Republicans did not like that. Um, this was in the middle of one of the rounds of protests in Iran. 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 No. Oh, 2009, the Green Revolution. Yes, okay. it was in the. It was. It was in the midst of that. And David Dreyer, who's also now retired, was the ranking member on the Rules Committee, a Republican from California, said something to the effect of, I think there might be more freedom on the streets of Tehran right now than there are in this hearing room. Of course, that's Again, hyperbole. Oh, <laughs> but... But people are, and I think less, maybe less so now, but the, the, the most interesting thing about the <coughs> Rules Committee is that people still, to some extent, forget. It's like the place where people are most likely to forget there are cameras. Yeah, it's also a place where the tyranny of the majority most comes into play. Because in all of the committees, there's none of this, like, oh, you need a procedural two-thirds vote or filibuster-proof, whatever. It's majority rule, and they stack the majority. There's many more Republicans. Three of the Republicans could forget to come, and they'd still have the majority over the Democrats. So they can do whatever they want and the, in the House. And the same deal in this, I mean, the issue in the Senate that's the issue du jour that you may hear about a lot is the filibuster, because they want to change the rule. I mean, it doesn't happen right now, but at the beginning of every two-year session it does. And these procedural ways are the ways in which either the minority can have a voice or they can get totally muzzled and just be screaming and yelling, like gesticulating wildly behind a piece of soundproof glass, basically, and don't get heard and don't get their say. And it, it, it goes to... What I think that actually is important to understand about rules is not necessarily for each individual bill, but for how it just creates this climate of the hatred that you see between the two parties. And it really does come not just from the experience of one really big thing or the other. But you keep hearing the Republicans in the Senate say, you never give us amendments. You always box us out. You never let us do this. And it's just like every little bit is another drop of water in the bucket. And Democrats in the House have the same complaint, which is why they're always trying to you know, put in when, when the House passes these closed rules that don't allow amendments, the Democrats always get what's called a motion to recommit. And it's a fascinating political story sometimes, because they'll always attach onto that motion to recommit whatever it is that they weren't allowed to talk about. Maybe not even what they weren't allowed to talk about that week, but what they got screwed over and weren't allowed to talk about two months ago. And they try to bring it back, and then they'll try to make a campaigning point. And you're like, why do I care? This is never going to go anywhere. But like, it's funny slash relevant because it goes to the feeling of animosity between the parties and how they try to use whatever they can, usually unsuccessfully, to try to make you know, their point because nothing's done without these rules getting in the way. So along those lines, um, the whole motion to recommit in the House has become an issue for uh, I was doing the whole shutdown and for some of my members particularly. And I've gotten very you know, hazy answers from them about why they're not supporting, why the Republicans who say they're in the middle are not supporting mm -hmm. Democrats. Like Dan and Company? Um, and what's that? Dan and Company? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, um, short of calling needles, who are the folks who you can get to <laughs> explain what it means to Democrats propose this? What exactly would it have meant to support that? You know, what are the reasons for somebody to oppose it? Like, who read read it? Sarah Binder's blog post this morning at the Monkey Cage. She's a professor at GW who is also at Brookings. Yeah, she good. she she would be the person who I would be telling you to call, but she happened to write a whole big thing about the history of the motion to re... about the history of discharge petitions and whatnot this morning. But if it's... Oh, so by the way. Even so it's just like a general house rules, like they're trying this arcane procedure. Yeah. I need someone to... Here's it's here. not arcane, though. I mean, like, yeah. here's the thing. is like, actually, I mean, if you want someone to quote, Sarah Bender's great. So are... There's a few other people... Don Wolfensberger things. at yeah. the Wilson Center, who used to be the staff director at the House Rules Committee. But you don't actually... I mean, this is not something that's that subjective. Like, if you just kind of learn it, you can... I find that I end up always just explaining it straight up in my stories, because it's just... I mean, there, there is a motion to recommit after every single 
ruled vote that there are no amendments allowed on. Now, there's two ways that bills pass through the House. I mean, okay, the two ways the bills pass through the Senate, maybe we should have done this, right, is straight up majority vote and then filibuster, procedural filibuster, which says you have to get 60 votes to overcome a bill dying, basically. In the House, you can either bring something up, Joanna should be doing this part, frankly, but you can either bring something up on the suspension calendar, which means that it's supposedly not controversial, and it means also that you don't get any amendments yeah, right, to it, but right. you need two-thirds of the House to support it in passing. This was an issue last week when the House tried to bring up these little rifle shot, oh, well, we'll refund the national parks, and we will refund the Veterans Administration, and we'll refund D.C., and they tried to bring it up under suspension, and they didn't pass, even though they had a huge majority of people voting for it. It wasn't two thirds; it was close, but not no cigar. Yeah. Um, so they didn't get it through. And the other way they can pass it is by simple majority rule, right? But when it's under simple majority rule, you have to allow amendments unless you take it to the rules committee and come back with a closed rule that says we will accept only the. We present the amendments to the rules committee. It comes back saying these are the amendments we'll consider and no others. Right? Right. Experience that? Right. And then right. you just need a simple majority. And when that happens, when you have it in that second way, there's always, is it right before or right after? It's right after, right? Right before final passage. Right before, right. So you have a vote on the rule, then you have a vote which passes by simple majority, then you have a vote on a motion to recommit. The, the Democrats get to present, the minority gets to present the motion to recommit, to which they attach whatever they want that's supposed to make a point. It's a politically charged vote, which is why Dent and company may decide they couldn't vote for it. Because what they're trying to do right now is on these motions to recommit, Democrats, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, I'm yeah. just filming. Yeah. Democrats are trying to say that like the clean CR is our motion to recommit. And recommit means basically you send it back to the committee, it doesn't right. come up for a full and vote. And what you got it doesn't pass as a bill, but it gets the vocal support. If it got the Republicans to vote for the motion to recommit, it would be a way of them saying, we like signing a discharge yeah. petition. On paper, we like the clean CR. Thus, if we take a vote straight up on the clean CR, we're taking a vote straight up. Right. It would be the same thing. We're already on paper. And, and, the, and, the, and there, there's a... There's another... There's a problem here uh, that's sort of another problem, which is... What we've been seeing with all these rifle shots is that a Democrat, Chris Van Hollen or whomever it is, proposes this motion to recommit with a for a, for the to vote be on a clean CR. Then a Republican is popping up and saying, "No, that's not germane." And the actual vote that's taking place is a motion to table and kill. The motion uh, to appeal the ruling of the chair yes, that the amendment's not it. germane. <laughs> the reason why this, the trouble with germaneness is that Congress runs on precedent. So if you ever once, and I don't know if anyone's even, you know, this is not something that would even necessarily be something you would write, but if you ever once rule that a, that a, that a bill that funds the entire government I, or an amendment that funds the entire government is germane to a measure funding the NIH. Something much narrower. Yeah. Something much narrower. Then that me that that's a precedent. So that means in the future, when you're de if you ever get back to regular order and you're debating the the Defense Department appropriation bill, and someone tries to offer an amendment about national parks. It'd be cool. You It'd be cool to it. if you if you <coughs> if you if you actually set the precedent that that's okay. So there's sort of a. Can I just that, that, yeah. that is really helpful, but outside of this very specific issue, and that yeah. does really help for like the immediate issue. But again, if there's some issue two three months down the road, and we don't know what it is, and you just need someone to explain it, what exactly were they voting on? Is the Republicans saying we voted for that? The Capitol Dome would have collapsed. And, Honestly. And if the, you know, the parliamentarian, the House Press Gallery, are either of those? Yeah, sure. I mean, honestly, I would say call the person who submitted the motion to recommit. Like, I mean, that that office is going to tell you exactly what it is that they're trying to get people to vote on, and then you're going to be like, okay, well, you know, why exactly are you voting? There were issues in last election season where they would vote on, like, you know, for random, random bills, there would be motions to recommit that talked about funding contraception for women under the health care law. You know, it's like... Again, did you really think this was ever going to get right. through? But Obviously the people not. Who, again, the people who support or oppose it are each going to like 
I've talked to Republicans on this, and they tell me, oh, it would be, you know, Nancy Pelosi would basically be in charge, and Democrats say, oh, it would have been no big deal, it would have just been a vote to yeah. where they stand. So I'm trying to find, like, a neutral... Yeah, that's, I mean, the actual rule that... Would be. Yeah, I mean, that's where you have to go through the outside, because okay. yeah. there are no... The House Press Gallery can't... Yeah, I mean, they obviously, yeah, I mean... Any other thing tonight, I mean, basically what anyone is going to tell you in that situation is it's a politically charged vote. Right. It's, 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 it's ransom. And the vote is, in some, to, some, to some extent, the vote is whatever the DTRIP and the NRCC... Whichever one of them is more convincing is what the vote is about, yeah. is really what it amounts to. There's no, you know, those are the two, for those of you who don't deal with campaigns very much, those are the Democrat and Republican campaign committees in the House, the people who are cutting political ads. And the question then becomes, it's, at that point, it's, it's, it's as much of a sales pitch, because yeah. you could probably call... You could call a political expert, actually, because you just want to be asking in these situations, like, at what point is this legitimate, or at what point is this a crapshoot? And any of the people who comment about, like, election politics yeah. actually would be the ones to go to about that and say, I mean, it's as much, it's like a campaign commercial, frankly. It's probably, you know, in terms of the weight of what it is, it's a campaign commercial happening on the House floor. So whoever you'd talk to about, you know, that sort of thing would be the person. Well, it isn't to, I mean, in some case, like this current stuff, what we're really looking for is a sense of whether this is unprecedented, whether it is uh, yeah. novel understanding of the world, or, so, or as the Republicans have said, you know, we've always had leverage at the debt ceiling. Well, if you want the novelty, that's the historian's office, and there's one on each side. Yes. Right? I think it's only to say that this actually, there's been hundreds of cases where the debt ceiling has been, but never has it been used in this way. You know, yeah, that the first the first call on that is the is the House or Senate historian's office, and they, uh, for reasons that, reasons that I don't know, um, frankly, um, the parliamentarian's office will never comment about anything. If you need it, if you have a question, if you have a question that really requires a parliamentarian, you literally have to find a retired <coughs> parliamentarian and call a retired parliamentarian. Oh, but there's who's it's that we were all calling when the filibuster was. Yeah, out. Alan Fruman and Bob Dove, who are really both nice guys. these two. They're the two retired Senate parliamentarians. What are their names again? Alan Fruman, F R U M I N, and I can I can probably make a note to myself to put together something that I will email. Um, and Bob Dove is the one that. Yeah. Right but that's just the Senate. That's not. Yeah. I don't know if there's a retired. I don't know if there is a. There's got to be someone out there on the house side. Yeah. But yeah, that's the. That's the. But the historian's office, in contrast, will comment either for attribution as according to the house historian's office or someone by name. Um, they will actually comment on that sort of. Well, have we ever done this before? Sort of question. Are they, on leadership or they, they are. They're not. They're not partisan. Um, I think the way it works generally is that they're, as far as I can tell, once they're hired, they don't. They're not. They're not an office where they get fired when the party control changes, yeah. which is different from the parliamentary. In like theory. Yeah, the chaplain can't get fired either. Right, it's kind of like the chaplain. Like, I mean, he can <laughs> drop massive hints in his practice. <laughs> 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 but he's supposed to be non -partisan. Also, I mean, I don't think I've dealt with the House historian that much, but yeah. I talk to Don Ritchie in the Senate all the time, and he's, he's great. So, yeah. <laughs> and if he doesn't know, he'll tell you exactly who to call the does. So. Yeah, and sometimes they'll be, sometimes they'll be like call because I can't think of her name off the top of my head, but there's a there's a woman at UCLA who is sometimes the person I've I've more than once been referred to her to say something that one of the historians would have said had they been able to say something partisan. <laughs> <laughs> Good Again. to know. We are out of time, but thank you guys so much. Oh, thanks for being here. Thank you.